the worst thing for founders um, and CEOs is to be reactive mm-hmm. all the time. Like you get hit from literally everywhere. And if you are only reactive to um, actions and, and, and situations, you will not have time yep. to actually run the business. So you need to distance yourself sometimes from uh, all of that and 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 go back to the basics, like why I started this, what is the solution I'm trying to, to build, and what is the challenge I'm trying to solve. That was the voice of May Methad, co-founder of Eventus, speaking from Dubai. I am your host, Ali Zweil, and this is the Startups Arabia podcast, where you learn about the Arab startups ecosystem from the best founders, investors, and operators in the region. Our guest today is May Methat. May is the CEO and co-founder of Eventus, an events and engagement platform in the leading event technology company in the Middle East. Eventus was acquired in July of 2021 by Bevy, a US-based enterprise software startup that has software that supports virtual conferences and community events. Over the course of its journey, Eventus raised over $4 million in VC funding and is successfully serving over 20,000 events in over 60 cities. May was named Entrepreneur of the Year by Arabian Business in 2016. In the Global Entrepreneurship Summit, she was recognized as one of the most promising entrepreneurs and represented the Middle East and the Middle Eastern ecosystem in an iconic panel with former President Barack Obama and Mark Zuckerberg founder of Facebook. This episode is sponsored by the venture capital firm Endure Capital. Endure Capital invests in early stage companies that will achieve incredible impact. If you're a founder that fits this criterion, contact the Endure Capital team on www.endurecap.com. That's Endure Cap, E-N-D-U-R-E-C-A-P. Or just click on the link in the show notes. Thank you to our sponsors for making this show possible. And now... Back to the show. Welcome to the Startups Arabia podcast. I'm very happy to have as my guest today, uh, May Mithat. Uh, May is the co-founder of the event management platform Eventus, uh, a huge force in the startup ecosystem in the region. She's uh, connecting with me uh, from Dubai. My first like experience with Eventus, this is my first time to actually virtually meet uh, May, but my first experience with Eventus was uh, at Rise Up where I was using the product. And uh, I remember reflecting on what a delightful product it is. It just did the job very effectively and it did it in a way that, that, that worked seamlessly and, and you know there weren't like crashes and what typically happens when we use uh, many uh, of these event uh, softwares. So uh, with that incredible, uh, incredibly uh, uh, positive experience uh, with Eventus, uh, I'd like to welcome you, May. Welcome. Thank you, Ali. Thank you so much. Uh, great. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And um, I'm happy you like the product. Uh, I loved it. So uh, just to get us started, uh, I'd love to... Uh, if. In a few minutes, if you tell us about like the story uh, of uh, what drove you to the startup uh, world, you know, what, and to make Eventus, you know, what happened? You started as just a normal software engineer, and, and then take us from there. Sure. Um, yeah, I um, I graduated as a software engineer. I love computers. I love internet. I love making things. And um, I love events. Like I'm, I'm a social person by nature. Um, I like to connect with people. I like to meet new people, make new friends. Um, I'm a very social person. Um, and I used to attend a lot of like conferences and events. And uh, um, I remember like attending few events. Like like my personal experience wasn't great because. I feel there's more that we can do and we can achieve. Um, like, for example, I can be sitting on the same table with someone who is, who can be like very relevant to my experience, who can help, and he's willing to that, but I don't know this person. Um, there was like no way for attendees to 
network and, and socialize um, on a digital platform before or during the event and, and definitely after the event. Um, so you just go there if you are not like social enough, if you can't network over coffee or like on the dinner table and all of that, you can't really connect with people. Um, so it started from here. We got the idea. Um, we did a lot of research and that was, that was, I don't know, like maybe a decade ago. <laughs> so there wasn't a lot of like competition and a lot of like apps uh, for events. Um, so we decided like, like I like this very much uh, to the extent that I decided I, I would quit my job and focus on this full time. Um, and at the same time, I was very interested in like startups and, and what's happening in the Valley and Silicon Valley. Um, it wasn't a lot of this happening in our region, especially in Egypt back then. Um, it was very new. Um, so everything, like all the information, all the news, the articles, everything you read on TechCrunch was like basically on Silicon Valley startups. Um, so I was very interested in that, trying to educate myself about it. And um, I just, that's it, quit my job, I decided that this is something very interesting. I would like to explore more. I would like to dig deeper in and um the journey of events has started and um yeah i we were a very small team we decided to build everything from scratch we decided to bootstrap before even um like like going into an accelerator or investors or anything um we spent some time um learning about the market itself um, like the events market and understanding the market like inside out like what happens what technology is there already, what organizers are using, what attendees are looking for. Um, so when we build a product, as you said in the beginning, um, it needs to work. Um, and of course, like we did a lot of mistakes. We did, it took us a very long time, um, but every step was, um, was very uh, inspiring, educational. Uh, we tried to learn from our mistakes. Wonderful. And and can you tell us about that early, you know, market finding uh, process? What was your first customer, for example? How did you win them? How did you uh, get them to uh, be on board? How did you learn about their needs? Um, we talked to a lot of uh, customers. Um, that was the first thing. And I think the most important thing, like we, we weren't shy to go and try to speak to anyone. Um, who is interested or who is working on the event space just to get their feedback, number one, and ask them about their needs and what they are looking for. Um, one interesting finding, for example, was we, from the beginning, we were building like a networking tool. This was the core of events from the beginning and the vision. Like we wanted to connect all the stakeholders um, like from attendees, speakers, sponsors, exhibitors, um, anyone who is like a stakeholder at the event. But at the same time, um, when we spoke to early customers, we found out they they actually care more about the ticketing part or invitation system. And like they want to make sure that someone will actually come and attend their event. So it, it will happen. Um, before they care about like the during event experience and the networking part. Um, so that was a, a very interesting finding. Um, we had to build it. Like we explored all the options and then we actually built um, this small ticketing platform or booking platform um, to make sure that customers, they have customers, um, like the customers of our customers. So we promote the event, um, there's ticket sales. So it's actually something that's going to happen. And then um, once this satisfied our customers, and then they were interested to listen about um, the other product we have, which was our cool product. So it was like maneuvering around um, to get early customers uh, uh, to the platform. So, yeah, I mean, I guess what I would underline or what I would double click on there is, is the fact that you didn't stick to your stubbornly to your original, uh, you know, uh, vision, but you actually listened to the problems of, the, of your customer that, that you were trying to serve. 
and you pivoted quickly to that and you delivered real value to them. And that's how you kind of sold them. Exactly. And it, it's also a different way, like like as an entrepreneur or as a founder, um, I always say like you need to be open minded and like listening to customers and also customer acquisition is there's a different ways to look at customer acquisitions. Like marketing is one way, but also it can be something in the product itself, like a new feature or a new expansion in the product that will unlock um, more um more customers and attract more customers uh, to the product itself. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't only like this is what we do, this is what we sell, this is how much it is. We were um, flexible enough to actually listen to customers and and add uh, on the product, not only by pushing more on sales and marketing. Interesting. So could you give an example of this product kind of led marketing? Uh... Or indirect marketing through the product? Um, there is a lot. Um, like this, the, the ticketing one is like the very obvious one for us, uh, for right. Eventus. And it, it actually turns out to be um, to be very profitable and to be like a revenue stream on its own. Like by time, we actually grew this and it was, it was a different uh, revenue stream. Um, and we used to, and it was like a major revenue stream for us. So it started as an acquisition tool, and it turned out to mm-hmm. be like a real product. Right. Okay. And, and can you tell me? I mean, when you felt at what stage did you feel you you had like product market fit that that yes, this is going to work. You know, we're going to have we have something here. Uh, product market fit. Yeah, of course. Um, it took some time, actually, um, but I remember once we unlocked once we unlocked like a certain type of customers and it was repeating customers. Um, uh, at the beginning, we were only getting like smaller size events or conferences, um, mm-hmm. which was like the maximum was five hundred, maybe a thousand attendees max. Um, but for for us, when when we started, um, we wanted to unlock like huge conferences and exhibitions and all of that. And once we once we got into this stage, um, we knew that we have like product market fit um, because it was repeat customers, customers that we didn't know in our network. Um, because at the beginning, as a as an entrepreneur, you rely on your network. Um, your investors. We started with um, entrepreneurship and startups events, which basically we were in the ecosystem. So we started with ecosystem events. So we knew them some way or another through introductions, through investors' introductions, or um, sometimes they were supporting a startup, so they were trying the, the, the product. But once we get out of this um, ecosystem, we knew that we had something and it's real and it's scaling. And um, I think by that time, we also moved to Dubai. Um, so we started in Dubai because it, it is and it, it wasn't still like the hub for events and conferences in the region. Um, yeah. So once we got like into a bigger remote market that we didn't know anyone in this market and it was like pure sales because they like the product not because we knew them or we have a personal relationship with them i think that was like the biggest trigger for us that this is working this is something big and it can grow yeah but, uh, yeah I, I would argue that you know even the startup conferences even though they wanted to support but they wouldn't have used your product if it wasn't actually a good and useful product so it's a, it was a great sign in and of itself, and it shows your, you know, the, the quality of your work. Uh, and now uh, you guys are like you have over twenty thousand events on your platform in over sixty cities. So I mean, it's uh, you know it's a huge amount of progress you've made. So I mean, uh, now ten years uh, almost uh, after you started Eventus. Uh, one year ago, there was a very uh, big event uh, in the startup's life, which is the acquisition um, by Bevy in the US. And it was quite 
it for me it was such a logical thing to happen uh i had like i had heard first about bevy from cmx because i, I was i'm interested in community management so i know they, they when they made the acquisition of cmx that's when i first heard of bevy and then they acquired you as well so it's like everything i'm a fan of they keep acquiring so uh it was uh interesting to see that happening uh but um i'd really love you to go deep because i mean there haven't been that many exits uh in the region many uh, definitely even less acquisitions specifically so if you could tell us about you know how this happened uh as, in as much detail as you can i'd really love to hear it and i'm sure the audience would Sure. As you said, it makes sense. Uh, like, like, like the two products actually complement each other. Um, Bevy is focused on community management um, and specifically community events, like community-led events. Um, for example, imagine uh, something like Startup Grind. Um, it's basically an organization that organizes events across the world um, with one or two um, big conferences in a year, but there's thousands, hundreds of other um, volunteers who actually organize local events in their cities. Um, this is happening in like Google GDG or the developer uh, program. Um, th there's more, like specifically in the tech industry, this is a growing trend and it's very um, interesting and, and and useful trend for communities to actually get together and learn about products and it brings company um, revenues that way. Um, so they focus on events from a different perspective than what we focus on. Um, they have a very interesting product and um, our technology can actually complement that to empower um, uh, large-scale conferences and also um, the mobile app, it made sense, like like in the community uh, industry, there is no one providing an app like ours, and that can be a huge advantage um, to customers and huge um, advantage to defensibility as well for baby. So it made sense. Um, we knew them for a long time because Startup Grime is one of our customers, which is a sister company um, to Bevy. Um, and actually CMX is also one of our customers. Um, we have been working with them for three, four years before the acquisitions. So we had this connection, we had this relationship. Um, and then when COVID happened, um, there was a lot of like consolidations in the market. There was a lot of like the need for more innovation in the market, I would say, um, in the events. And we... I believe we did a good job in like pivoting from the physical world to the virtual world for events. Um, and we adopted our uh, technology and mobile app and everything in very short time, we managed to actually launch a full virtual events platform. Um, and we had a decent size of like customers and events. We had a really good feedback from um, conferences um, and from attendees. Um, so adding the two technologies together, it made sense. And it made sense for both of us to unlock totally different scale. Okay. So, I mean, what happened? Did you approach them? Did they approach you? You know, how did this, I mean, they knew you, obviously you knew each other for a few years. They approached us. Um, and as I said, like, it made sense. Like, Like, they were looking for something. We were always like, connected um we were chatting like me and derek the, the ceo we were chatting as like two founders were in the same situation and COVID happened and we were like um exploring ideas and <clears throat> and just like checking on on what's happening and then um he brought up this conversation um it made sense we also like by that time, um, like the idea of an exit or an acquisition was already on our mind um, as founders for Eventus um, because we, we received different other offers. Because as I said, like when something very big happened in the industry, um, like COVID, you start to see a lot of consolidations, a lot of like 
bigger companies trying to innovate and usually they are slower than startups and slower than smaller teams who can actually um, innovate, build something and like change their processes and everything and start something um, faster than corporates and faster than big companies. So that was a trend in the market. Um, so we already like have been seeing this. So we have been like talking about inter- about it internally, and um, we got approached by a um, few other uh, companies actually interested in uh, in acquiring Eventus. Um, and it was about like, are we willing to do this or not? And the second question is, who is the best uh, player or the best fit? Uh- yeah, makes sense. Uh, and and when you with when you talk about best fit, are you talking basically financially, or are there other things you looked at? Financially is one thing, but this is mainly for, of course, founders, but also investors and shareholders. They look at that. But um, for us, it was like the full package, like how, like culture was a big thing at Eventus and the team and. Um, team security and, and and the product itself. We are a product uh, first company, so we really care about the product and adding an impact by the product. So this was one big uh, thing that we focused on. <clears throat> and overall, like the size of the company, um, how are we going to add to them and how they are going to add to us as well? Um, is there... Um, like a pass or career pass for the team um, also to be uh, on board. Um, the business case, like in general, does it make sense or, or not? Um, because we have seen some acquisitions where like they just like take the team and shut down the company. Um, some other, um, there's different ways for acquisitions. So this is one thing we didn't want. We wanted to actually like contribute with the technology itself. So it wasn't like an aqua hire. We need some engineers in the space and we'll assign them to work on whatever we want. So this was one of the red flags for us, I would say. Um, we wanted to continue what we uh, what we built and continue on the same vision. And um, the second was like alignment. Like, as I said, like culture was a big thing. So we wanted to make sure that we are aligned. And because we had this... Um, long-term uh, connection with Bevy and relationship with Bevy through CMX, through Startup Grind, and, and knowing the, the, the people um, and the team itself, um, we felt they have a similar culture. Um, we felt right. it just, it, it, felt, it felt right. <laughs> and at the same time, it was um, like right. the financials, it was a good terms, and it was one of, of the best deals yeah. we got. And, and and how long did the process take from that first conversation with Derek until you actually closed the deal and the money was signed? You know, the money was transferred, the contract was signed. Wow, great question. I would say um, five to six months, give or take. Um, yeah, yeah, which is. Which is not long to, to be honest. Like I have seen I have seen more. Um, like from the beginning, um, the paperwork itself, like this is uh, it's as as if you're fundraising. <laughs> so from the beginning, like fundraising, we usually say it takes like six to nine to a year, maybe more um, in our region. Um, but like we were we were trying to be efficient um, and also the more prepared both sides like the more your books are in place your um your paperwork your legal structure and all of that if it's in place that um it makes it easier to finalize everything quickly and also the biggest part is basically getting approvals from everyone like all the shareholders they need to be on board um and you need I There's a lot imagine. of like communication. Uh, I can imagine that that could have been hard dealing with many shareholders, and uh, and af- you know what about post acquisition? Did you start planning for the post acquisition phase like towards the end of the actual acquisition closing, 
or did you start the post acquisition phase after you closed the deal and announced it and then you started and and, and what was in the post acquisition activities what did you do yeah uh, I, I would say there was like three phases um, the first phase is founders only trying to make the business case out of this acquisition um, so it was us the founders main shareholders or main investors and from the other side um, the founders as well and we had a lot of like meetings, a lot of communication, trying to make sense, trying to get to know each other as people, as like like these are two teams or two groups of founders who will be joining forces and working together. So we, we try to connect on even a personal level, getting to know the, the people and making sure um, that this is a team you actually want to work with them um, um, after the acquisition. So this was the first thing. And then once it made sense and we agreed on everything, there was um, the second phase was like paperwork slash um, preparing for what what happens after the acquisition. Um, so the paperwork was one thing and the communication with investors and getting everything and everyone on board, um, making sure we have negotiations for the best deal and all of that. Um, and of course, involving lawyers and the legal stuff. But at the same time, we were working in parallel about like, how are we going to communicate it to the team? Um, who should um, we tell from the team first? What's the communication plan um, on both sides, of course? And the sec- and, and, and also like, how how are we going to integrate the two technologies together or the two products together? What's the final result? What are the milestones that we want to achieve? Um, so that was like more in-depth or in-detailed um, preparing, I would say, for what happens after the acquisition. Um, and that was very useful um, because if we skip this part and we announce that we are merging the two companies or we're getting acquired, when you tell the team, at least for, for us at Eventus, when we told the team, um, there was a lot of like questions and a lot of um, insecurities and and some some people didn't know what does it mean for them, uh, what does it mean for them even professionally, um, career-wise, job security and all of that. So when we prepared that together, we had a plan um, and we answered all the questions. Um, or at least most of the questions. Um, so there was, we were going with a plan. It right. wasn't just like we're announcing the acquisition and then we were figured out post acquisition. Absolutely. So you kind of you prepared a communication plan, you prepared a product integration plan, and you prepared a team integration plan, and you actually executed that uh, off the bat, and, and that made things much more effective. Cool. Um, yes. Exactly. And that made the third phase very, um, it wasn't easy, of course, but it made it easier once right. we were, now we're one company and we're working together. Um, everyone had a plan uh, for what they are, they should do at least for the next three to six months. Okay, so so let me like go back a little in the story uh, and, uh, you know, on the way to this acquisition, you raised money, I think, more than once, uh, a total of over $4 million. So can you tell us about these raises, you know, how they happened and and why you decided to raise each stage and how it went? Sure. Um, <clears throat> at the beginning, we put strap for some time. Um, we wanted to have an MVP, have something working and, and proven to be working um, at least with uh, some customers um, and then we, we raised the seed round um, from angel investors and it was i would say the kickstarter for us um, it was a booster to get us to really build the product that we need um, to have the mvp and uh, like the real mvp that can be um, that can be scalable and also the processes the infrastructure and all of that 
And then, um, and, and having angels at this round was very, um, was very useful because angels usually invest in the founders, invest in the team. And by invest, I mean they invest also their time. Um, they act as mentors. Um, so it was an easier relationship with them. Um, whenever we, like at this phase, I would say um, we were learning a lot of things. We were learning what's corporate structure. We were learning what are board meetings, how to manage board meetings, um, how to hire a team, how to scale the team, how like, like a lot of things um, that usually um, for a first time founder, you don't get exposed to before uh, being in the situation itself. So having a mentor and having um, early investors who are invested in this, um, this was um, invaluable for us. Um, and then the next stage is basically um, scaling up. Um, and this is where we moved to Dubai. And we were looking for um, basically investors in the region. Um, like we decided that we want to scale regionally. Um, so Dubai, Saudi. Um, and so we tried to get in contact with some investors in the region. And it made sense because we we needed the network, we needed the exposure, we needed the connections um, to get us to the next level. Um, and we had we had the product, as well. it was still very early um, when it comes to revenues, but the product was very strong and the vision was strong from the beginning. Um, so we managed to get some um, early stage investors. And then after how, that, um, how big was that round? Year, Sorry, years after that, um, around five hundred thousand dollars. And then after that, you sorry. Um. Yeah, and then after that, we got into um, the first uh, like the series A round. Um, once we spent like a year in Dubai or a year and a half in Dubai. We had some regional um, regional uh, customers. We had uh, we had the team. We had the sales process. We had something that it felt scalable, and it felt um, um, we knew it is this is a something that if we spend more money on it, it will scale. It will reach to the next level. So by then, we knew we were we were ready for the Series A round, um, and uh, we got more. Uh, serious investors, uh, institutional investors, I would say. Um, and uh, it was a bigger round. It was a two million round. And um, and then we took it from there. And then the last round was when COVID happened. Well, tell me that story. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, so COVID happened. <laughs> we were we were in a very uh, good track. We we had a great first quarter in 2020. Um, we had a lot of like like I remember this like February. I I have been like all over the place. I have been. We had customers in the U.S. in Dubai, Jordan, Egypt, Saudi and like different places and I, for some reason I, I had to attend some of these events so I was traveling all the time and then I came back to Cairo and there was a lockdown like literally a few days uh, after I landed there was a lockdown um, you can go anywhere um, airports shut down and all of that and then COVID was a reality and all our business model is built on gatherings and people meeting each other and at the beginning, we had, you know, this denial phase where you're like, this is nothing, it's going to pass, it's just a few weeks, and then we would go back to normal. And then you re realize that this is the normal, it's bigger than what we expected. Um, for us, because we had this um, global exposure, so we have seen it first, uh, we had some events in like Singapore and, and, and Asia, um, and it was the first uh, events to get cancelled and postponed. So we started seeing the trend early on. 
um, and we had to act fast on it. So we were, after passing like the first denial and shock phase, um, we had to go back to drawing uh, board. Like now what are we going to do? Um, we involved everyone in the process, like the team, investors, um, everyone, and we started thinking, what should we do? And it was very hard uh, phase, I would say. And we decided that we have we're we're engineers. We know how to code. We're already we're building a digital platform for events. So what does it need to convert this into a virtual platform for events? Um, and like it was very pivotal moment I would say in the in the journey of Eventus um, and we got the idea we tried to reimagine what is a virtual event or a virtual conference and um, we drafted everything we tried to understand the market we spoke to customers and actually it felt it felt we. I felt more responsible actually to build this because our customers were coming back to us and asking us as a technology experts, like what should we do? Um, so instead of us going after customers and actually trying to convince them to use the product, they were coming back to us and asking us what should we do about our business, like the entire business. Um, so. Um, we had a plan. We put together uh, a plan and we went to um, investors and we got uh, we got packed by actually existing investors and new investors nice. as well. So you turned the challenge into a, a new opportunity, so to speak. So, so I mean, exactly. what would you say are the lessons? I mean, right now, we're kind of the world is going into an economic slowdown. We have the war in Ukraine and its effect on the world economy. A lot of VCs are like holding off on their investments and delaying them and things like that. So there's, uh, we're seeing uh, people lay off startups, especially lay off uh, uh, employees globally uh, and in the region. So are there any lessons like from this COVID-19 uh, hit that you especially took because you were in this real life gathering business at, at the time, but you really pivoted quickly. Uh, is there Are there like lessons for, for startups in the current environment, in your opinion? Yeah, of course. Um, I, I actually see it as a very similar situation to what happened at COVID. I think different sectors are affected now um, with the economic situation. Uh, maybe they, ha maybe it wasn't like the same sectors affected during COVID. Like COVID, it was events, travel, uh, anything physical basically got affected. But on, on the contra contrary, anything that's delivery, um, e-commerce um, was was booming. Like people staying at home and they are ordering anything and anything they can online. So we saw a huge boom on delivery, on logistics, on um, on e-commerce in general, like anything e-commerce. Um, and now these sectors are actually the most people are affected by uh, the war and the economic situation and what's happening because um, it was like gross at any cost. Um, you need to grow, you need to have a bigger market share. And then, and, and people forgot about like unit economics mm. and profitability and all of that. But the biggest lesson at least for us during COVID is even even that we could raise during COVID, which was very rare for events um, uh, platform to to fundraise during COVID. Um, it was it was a very expensive money, um, and it was also uh, very hard. And we knew that we need to be cautious about what's happening and. Um, we were not sure if the COVID would be like for a few months, for a year or more. So we were trying to be smart in spending um, this money. Um, so we took all the measures uh, from the beginning, um, like any cost cutting that we can do on like whatever platforms, on tools that we are not using, on anything that we can uh, optimize. So optimization was a big uh a big topic that we talk about, like in every team meeting, we talk about optimization. Um, so that was very big and, and very important for us. 
I think I think now we are back to this, and we are back to like the basics of startups. When you start as when you bootstrap, you have limited resources, and startups in general they have limited resources, and you need to be cautious about how are you spending these resources. Um, and and I, I think uh, like like different things, especially with like the late day offs that's happening right now, um, which also happened during COVID. Um, communication is very important, um, especially not only for the teams or, or, or the individuals who are affected by the layoff, but it's crucial for people who are staying in the company to have faith in the company, to have also um, credibility on the management and the leadership of the company um, and the future of the company, um, to keep working as hard as they can um, to actually build the next um phase of the company and the future of the company because when this big event especially layoffs and and with the amounts we are seeing right now like a lot of people are like 30 percent cuts or or more this is huge so everyone in the company they feel um insecure they feel they might be next they feel hesitant about the uh, founders or the leadership um, and and they start to question everything. They start to question all the decisions and all the like the vision of the company, and all of that. And and we're also seeing like on the global scale, we're seeing startups who are like literally shutting down and very well funded startups. Um, so it hits the team. Um, so I would say like communication is very crucial and it's very important and it's on the leadership team and on the founders to actually be emphasized and to um to communicate transparently um with their team and explain what's happening because sometimes what we know as founders or um or vcs or like a leadership team sometimes it's not translated or it's not it's not like taken as the same with individuals. Um, so this is like the biggest lesson uh, for me to be honest. Uh, yeah, the, the second thing is basically the product itself. Like whatever the solution, um, whatever the solution you're building, you need to be innovative and also uh, like, like I have seen some companies who continue to do what they are doing um, even with the changes, like the world is changing around us right now, the same way it was changing during COVID. Um, so COVID, people are not going out their houses. Now people are insecure, they are spending less, there is inflation, so they are spending less on anything that's luxury and and sometimes not spending or trying to like even save on uh, necessities. So if the company or if the management team or the leadership team doesn't like rethink what's their product plan or what's their strategy um because we started this with with some market conditions and now these market conditions are changing and the user behavior is changing so we need to go back and like revisit the strategy um it might be it might be the same for some companies, but for, I would say for a lot of companies, they need to change as well. Um, they need to be flexible enough to like know where to spend, know where to, what are the bits or the new bits they are making um, to grow this and, and have a, right. a sustainable business. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I mean, the three things you brought up are so important for companies in times like these, but, if you adopt them, they're actually useful for startup at any time. So one is being capital efficient, you know, being aware of costs and, and not going crazy just because you raised a lot of money, say, to, you know, spend it, uh, overspend. The second is a communication and communicating clearly to the team at all times. And the third is flexibility with the product and really being having your ear to the ground with the with the market and knowing when the market has changed and being responsive to the needs of your customers and being customer focused. 
and 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 really these are great lessons in 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 general and even more so of course in times of uh, you know where where there isn't that much money around to support uh, inefficiency and things like that so all great lessons thank you mike um all right let me let me move the conversation uh, a little uh, i have a few questions uh, uh, here so i mean what do you see is like let's talk about the regional um, i know now you're part of a us uh, company but but uh, for the region here what do you see is the biggest challenges and the biggest opportunities of working and, and starting a startup here um like opportunities are um, it's the same i would say like we have a lot of challenges which is can be translated into opportunities when you build solutions for it or you build products or companies to solve these challenges um and it's across the region um so we have seen and we'll see more like startups from Egypt, from Dubai, from Saudi, and they are serving like the entire um, MENA region um, because it's similar one way or another um, uh, and the tra- challenges are similar. Um, also, the opportunities in like fundraising now um, is way easier than when we yep. started, for example, uh, or even like three, four years ago. There is more opportunities, there is more success cases um, and success stories in the region, um, either acquisitions or even uh, uh, companies going public or or scaling and being like a very big uh, profitable companies. So we're we're seeing this trend, and and we have more and more I would say experienced founders, um, which will help in like accelerating the time to to really uh, kick off the startup. Like it took us a long time when we started to actually understand what we're building and understand the dynamics of the market and the investment and all of that. And even like the fundraise, it took us very long time. But now it's there is more access to capital. There is more market. There is more maturity. Um, there is more uh, like internet is everywhere and, and and access to like smartphones is everywhere. So all of that helped. And, and of course, like the fintech revolution that's happening in the region. Um, and, and so all of that is helping in, in creating the next generation of startups. Um, and, and even the startups from the early days, um, like the early employees or the founders, they are now coming back and starting new business and, and new companies. Um, so that adds a lot to their experience and credibility. Um, and they are not doing the mistakes um, they have seen in the first startup, for example, uh, or witnessed yep. in the first uh, companies. Um, so all of that is very, very big. And, and it's all opportunities. I think what, what's happening economically right now um we will see. Like, <laughs> no one can tell how long this will last. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing startups fundraising. Uh, we're seeing, like, like there is a lot of, like, I would say the focus would be on necessities more than um, luxury products right now, or at least for the next couple of years. Um, profitability will be one big uh, ask for, from investors. Uh, to be able to fundraise um, so these are like the few things if startups and founders um, like considered from the beginning i think they will be in a, yep. in a good uh, i love shape. that answer um so uh Thank it's you. just typical of, of the best founders you know the, the looking at the opportunities even looking at the challenges as opportunities um yeah so Going back to the the story of Eventus, are, are there ever were there ever turning points or you know uh, tough times during the other than COVID, uh, where you actually considered maybe closing Eventus or not continuing on the path? Uh, did you ever meet hard times like that, or were things pretty uh, smooth? 
uh, nothing is pretty smooth. <laughs> it's always uh, yeah. ups and downs. <laughs> um, yeah, of course. Like 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 fundraising on its own is very challenging, and 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 sometimes you feel like even if you have the deal and you have everything, um, the deal is not closed yep. until the money is in the bank. So things can get dragged um, to an extent that you can literally be tracking your like bank account and balance, and if the money is not in in like the right time you will run out of cash. Um, so even if everything is going well, it looks fine, you have a term sheet, even if you signed like a shareholder agreement, but if the money is not really in the bank, it's not done. It's not, you don't have a deal. Um, so fundraising is always stressful and uh, um, and it's very like emotionally stressful for, for founders and CEOs specifically. Um, and, and and also like competition, there's there's a lot of things that can go wrong uh, when you are building a startup. Sometimes you hire your A star employee or like executive, and you believe this is the person that will take the company to the next level, and then they get headhunted to another company, for example. So it happens all the time. Um, you just need to be flexible enough. You need to be prepared for all of that. And don't get emotionally involved with to an extent that you can't actually focus and and um, yeah. and get out of it. I would say, like like the worst thing for founders um, and CEOs is to be reactive mm -hmm. all the time. Like you get hit from literally everywhere, and if you are only reactive to um, actions and 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 situations you will not have time yep. to actually run the business. So you need to distance yourself sometimes from uh, all of that and 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 go back to the basics, like why I started this, what is the solution I'm trying to, to build and what is the challenge I'm trying to solve and inspire your team and build an ownership within the team right. to actually help you achieve that. Okay. Yeah, makes perfect sense. And, uh, you know, for everyone's thinking of uh, starting up, you know, this is a warning from May that it's a stressful uh, life. Uh, it's a fulfilling life, but, it's, but it is stressful. Uh, I would uh, double click on that one. <laughs> Very stressful. Uh, so, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's like uh, maybe go to the bigger picture of the ecosystem uh, a little. Um, and maybe give advice to people and also shed light on something. So I'd like to ask you some questions on that. Uh, for example, uh, I'm supposing that you sometimes advise, uh, you know, uh, founders uh, who are in an earlier stage and all that. And I would like to ask you, I mean, your advice, for example, on how to choose a co-founder. Yes. Uh, what's the best way to do that? And, you know, what's, what, what is a good co-founder relationship? Uh, that's a great question. I love that. Uh, because I, I don't know how solo founders are actually, like, they manage to do this. It's very hard. And co-founders, they can make it or break it because they are your first team, your first supporters. Um, and, and there's a lot of, like, dynamics that can go wrong between co-founders. Um, so the first advice is basically choose choose the person that you can trust. Like, like trust is by far is the biggest thing uh, when it comes to choosing a co-founder because things will go wrong. You will have fights internally. Um, and and like, like anything and everything you can think of can literally go wrong. But if there is no trust, um, it right. will just like break the relationship. But if there is a trust, and, and there's some boundaries and some um, transparency in the situation. Um, and, and I would say the second thing is respect, um, because when you respect your co-founder, you listen. Um, and, and everyone, they need a second opinion. Um, like, like 
founders and CEOs, they can't just go and like make all the decisions on their own. They need someone to challenge them. They need someone to think with them, to brainstorm with them, to actually come up with the best decision. Um, and, and all the decisions like business, product, from fundraising, choosing investors and all of that. Um, but at the same time, um, having this trust and respect, eventually um, it will help in another uh, area, which is basically each, each of the founders, um, they should have a specific uh, part of the organization that they are responsible on um, or a specific like they complement each other's and their skills and their uh, what they are doing. Um, so, for example, if you have like a product or a financial or a business uh, or a technical founder, um, you can you can make all that you can challenge everything the way you want, but at the end you need to respect who is making the decisions and you need to follow that. Like, and and even if you have like a very experienced um, CTO. Once the CEO makes the decision, the whole team should follow and like the whole company should follow and rally um, around this decision and, and make it happen. Um, but it's very important to challenge and, and listen and also for like the CEO and then the founder to actually listen to that um, because no one can make all the yeah. right decisions. Yeah, okay. F- final question before like we go into the rapid fire questions. Um, because I mean, some, some of the people uh, listening to us are not really uh, familiar with the ecosystem and the culture in the region and things like that. Uh, what are your views or wh- what's your experience as a female founder uh, in the Arab region? Do you, do you feel there have been any disadvantages, advantages, uh, experiences in general? Uh, I have a love-hate relationship with yeah. this question. I know. I, I read <laughs> about it in an interview. You were saying uh, uh, male. You don't see a difference between male and f- female founders. Uh, I agree with that. But but you know, people want to listen to this to this reply regardless. So I thought I'd ask it. <laughs> sure, um, it's definitely challenging, um, but. But on the other side, because this is this is like let's let's all admit like this is a male-dominated um, industry by all means, from founders to VCs to investors to everyone. Like the whole ecosystem is male-dominated. However, um, you need to be you need to be very credible. You need to be for as a female. You need to be very credible, very courageous, very smart um basically you need to you need to up your game like 10 times um to get in um and and to get seen as um as a like a founder in general um but at the same time um we're not seeing like the crazy stories we're hearing um in silicon valley or in other regions or uh, all of that. Like, um, I think what what people are expecting is if you are smart enough, if you are good enough as a founder in general, um, which is a little bit harder to prove if you are female because there are some stereotyping and and and, and, and all of the all of this. But once you do that, um, a lot of people are willing to support, and I personally got a lot of support from everyone, and not only females, um, but there's a lot of like, like most of our early investors were male. Um, they were mentors, they were supporters, they were advisors. And and just, I think one advice to female founders is not to be shy and go the extra mile and go and ask um, and be furious about like your your asks and your questions and, and what you are doing. Um, it's just an. You need to do an extra work <laughs> to actually prove it to everyone, internally in the company, in the team, and externally with the ecosystem, with the with customers, with VCs, and with everyone. Um, I don't see it as a black and white situation. It's um, it it's not black, definitely, uh, but it's not also very welcoming ecosystem. 
but at the same time, once you are once you are proving good, everyone will will actually be there to support and to help, even if they are not like, for example, investors. Even if they are not investing, they are willing to help with connections. They are willing to help with introductions, with with a lot of things. So don't take it personally. Um, this is happening everywhere, and um, I, I think even the numbers in our region is way better than um, a lot of other regions uh, when it comes to fundraise, fundraising for female-led startups. Um, to like all the numbers, even even the team um, and the di- diversity inside the team. Um, like most of the startups, at least I know, they have a good ratio between female yeah, and, and it's it's female. one of the, I think the most surprising things for people from outside the region uh, when they realize that we have a better probably statistics than the U.S. for example uh, on these things. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and yeah. I mean, do you do any angel investing or uh, startup advising or things like that if somebody wants to reach out to you? Advising, yes, of course. Uh, investments, not yet. Uh, on my mind, haven't done cool. officially done it okay, yet. Okay, so I mean, thank you very much for all these uh, great uh, conversations. And and I, I had just to, to wrap up a few quick fire questions, um, um, and then we close. So the first one is: Is there a book or books that you like to recommend to people? Um, the hard thing about yeah, hard things. I totally agree with that one. It's just you know, you feel like he's talking, he's telling your story when you read it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, um, any um, the second question? What do you? What's your go-to uh, de-stressing uh, thing that you do? How do you de-stress when you're under a lot of stress? Um, travel if I if I can. If not, totally disconnect and watch movies and TV okay. series. Uh, of course, in COVID that was difficult, so it must have been just all movies. <laughs> yeah, Netflix and chill. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, who would who do you think we should have on the podcast as a guest? Um, uh, Omar Gabr from Instabank. He is a founder that I uh, truly respect. And right. well, they're on our target list, so previously I'm glad also. you think so. Um, uh, okay, one uh, other quick fire question, which is, um, you know, what's the question that you thought, you know, that, that I haven't asked you that maybe I should have? <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard one. Um, Nothing in my mind, to be honest. Um, yeah, actually, I have one. Um, yeah. Um, I think the question is basically, how does it feel uh, for founders to sell their companies? <laughs> um, this is the yep. most question I get uh, since the acquisition. And uh, to give you briefly the answer, I think it's a, it's a mix of feelings. Like before... Before that, there was like, it's very emotional. It's very, uh, um, it needs a lot of like maturity from from founders, um, like emotionally to distance their, themselves from like like the attachment of like the company itself. Um, but at the same time, it's this is the goal like that everyone is working towards to build great company, um, sell it and then start a new one or do something else in their lives. Um, so it's uh, I expected to hear that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's almost like like sending your 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 kid to college. So you know, exactly. you, you know you, it had to happen, but it's like you know it doesn't feel it's bittersweet. Yeah. Yeah, but that's... one thing which is like I can imagine a lot of founders like st- struggle with is basically uh, even if they spend like especially if they spend like a lot of time uh, working on the startup is um, some identity crisis they feel um, like yep. I have been known as like 
my from Eventus, my the CEO of Eventus. What does it mean right now after there's, for example, no Eventus or after I sell Eventus? Um, yeah. So that's uh, I I heard the same thing from like other founders as well uh, when they sell their company or they move on to something else. Um, so. Um, like founders like, mentality and uh, yeah <laughs> that's a that's a big thing and it's a real thing yeah so thank you very much me i'd i like to close like on uh with gratitude so um my final question to you is what is a gift that somebody has given you in your life that, that has made a positive difference on it? um Great question. On, um, I don't want to sound like uh, cheesy or anything, but I would say uh, I would say my friendship with Nihel, my co-founder, um, it was the greatest gift professionally and personally. Um, it's not like something physical, but having this relationship it uh, it saved the company many times um to have someone as a support system throughout the journey um and also uh, outside the business world we're we're friends and we're very good friend best friends basically um so the emotional support and all of that that's that's the greatest gift um that got me through a lot of uh, a lot of situations and hard times and uh, uh, basically being there whenever uh, I needed there. Well, it's not cheesy. It's actually beautiful. Uh, thank you very much, <laughs> Mayim Mithat, for joining the podcast. Uh, very thank happy you so to much have you. for having me. Thank you, Mayim. This episode is sponsored by the venture capital firm Endure Capital. Endure Capital invests in early stage companies that will achieve incredible impact. If you're a founder that fits this criterion, contact the Endure Capital team on www.endurecap.com. That's Endure Cap, E-N-D-U-R-E-C-A-P. Or just click on the link in the show notes. Thank you to our sponsors for making this show possible. Thank you for listening to this episode of Startups Arabia podcast. If there was something you really liked about what the guests said today, reach out to them on social media and tell them what you liked. And of course, if you haven't subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? You don't want to miss any of our great upcoming episodes. Also, please rate us and give us comments on our social media accounts so that we know how to improve. And also tell us what you like. We don't mind hearing that either. Until next time, this was your host, Ali's Whale.